Hi and welcome to episode 17 of Understanding Darktable. This week we're going to look at the crop tool. I figure this is something that you're probably going to want to access even when you're a newbie to Darktable, so we should probably cover it early. At the end of this episode I'm going to do a little bit of uh, subscriber Q&A, uh, or not so much Q&A as some stuff that came in via email anyway, which I'll address. But let's get to the crop tool. Okay, so I've got this image. It's an outtake from our holiday to Europe in 2017. Uh, we'll start with our crop and rotate tool and we'll notice there's a whole bunch of different options here. So first up, we've got the flip tool and this will allow us to flip our image horizontally or vertically or both, which is essentially a 180 degree rotation. Set that back to none. Next up, we've got the angle tool. This will allow us to straighten horizons or vertical lines within our images. And there are four different ways we can interact with this angle tool. We can left click on the slider to simply you know, do course adjustments like so. We can use our right click and enter a value manually, two degrees, like so or minus two degrees, like so. We can use our mouse wheel to simply increase or decrease the degrees of rotation. With my mouse, it's currently doing a quarter of a degree per click of the mouse. I'm assuming that would be the same for all mice, but I don't know for certain. But the fourth way, and this is the one I love the most because I think it's the most intuitive, is to simply right click and drag on the image. So in this particular image, I'd like this tower to be vertical. So I move my mouse up to here, right click and drag this line down and basically just draw the line so it's in line with the side of the tower. And I can see that equates to a rotation of minus 1.62 degrees. Release and bam, it's done. So to me, that is the quickest and easiest way to get your horizons level or your verticals vertical. I love it. Now, there was a time when I first started with Darktable where I kind of missed not having the corners that you would normally get in other image editing programs like Photoshop or Lightroom, where you could grab the corner and use that as a rotation tool. However, once I discovered this right click and drag tool, I just realized that that is by far and away the most efficient way of straightening horizons or verticals. So I kind of don't miss the rotation corners anymore. We'll come back to the keystoning in a minute. Automatic cropping defaults to yes, and most of the time you are gonna to wanna to leave that switched on. What would happen is if we switch that to no and we then dialed in some rotation, we can see we end up with these black triangles where we don't have pixels to fill the image. So not sure why you would necessarily want to turn automatic cropping off, but at least the developers have given you that option should you need it. Next up, we've got guides. Now you can turn the guides off with the none option and that means you just get the bounding box and nothing else. We can then go to grid, which essentially gives us two lots of rule of thirds overlaid. <laughs> so you get rule of thirds and then rule of thirds inside rule of thirds. Then we can go to just rule of thirds without the second layer of a rule of thirds. We can go to the metering I don't quite understand what metering is meant to do, but it's there. Then there's perspective. So if you have something that you want to sit in the dead center of the frame, this is a great way of positioning it so that it does sit exactly in the frame, even after the frame has been cropped. Next, the diagonal method. Must admit, I'd never heard of that one. Harmonious triangles. Again, not one I've used. And finally, the golden mean. 
Now, there's a couple of things I want to address with harmonious triangles. This last option, flip guides, that is only of any value to you in harmonious triangles and golden mean, and you'll see why. You can flip the guides horizontally, which does that, or vertically, which doesn't change anything, or do both. And then we're back to pretty much where we started. Likewise, with golden mean, there are some extra options here. You can have golden sections, which is just the nine boxes. You can have the spiral sections, which are a little hard to see, but they are there. You can have the golden spiral, or you can have everything at once. And likewise, we can then use the flip command to flip whereabouts those golden mean divisions fall across our image. Next up, we've got the aspect ratio. By default, this will say original image. And what that means is that whatever dimensions your camera has exported the image as or created the image as, those will be the ratios that the original image will use. So most cameras are 3.2, which is also 6.4. Uh, some cameras shoot 5.4. It all depends on what the camera is, but whatever the original aspect ratio was, you can always get back to that by using this original image option. Now you'll notice that these first two options, freehand and original image, do not have any numbers to the right of them like the rest of these options do. That is because these two images don't really have an aspect ratio that you can work with because in original image it's fixed according to how the image was created and freehand lets you break all the rules so you can have whatever image dimensions you want. All of the other options here start from square which is a ratio of one to one so longest side to shorter side is one to one and the ratio gets bigger and bigger as we go down this list. So if you want 16 to 9, because you want to export to a video file, you might do that. But then you suddenly realise, hang on, I shot this image vertically in portrait mode, and I want to export it to using my video, and my video is going to be in landscape orientation. How do I make my crop landscape rather than portrait, even though the image is portrait. That, my friends, is where this little circular arrow icon comes in handy beside the aspect ratio. That will simply rotate the crop, not the image. So now we've got a 16 by 9 crop that is landscape over the top of an image that was shot in a portrait mode. Now, to change the size of these crops, I'm just going to switch that back. We've got a couple of different ways we can work. We can go to one of the ends or sides of the bounding box and shrink the image consistently from both sides, like so. And we can do that from the top as well. We can do that from the sides, which will bring the top and bottom in and the side that we're dragging in and leave the opposite side fixed. Likewise, we can do it from the other side. We can then click and drag to reposition where we want to crop to be. And you will notice that when you do any of these modifications to the crop tool, Darktable shows you the pixel dimensions of the image at that crop level. And the last thing to look at is the keystoning, and this is why I chose this particular image. As we can see from this image, apart from the fact that I shot it at a weird angle, we've got a pretty nasty case of collapsing verticals. That's going to happen. You shoot with a wide angle lens from ground level, looking upwards, things are going to collapse. It's just the laws of nature. Not much we can do about that. Makes me feel like I'm on the set of the movie Inception. But what we can do is go into keystoning, choose vertical, and what we get are these two vertical lines here. And in the middle they have an infinity symbol, 
and then there's a red circle up the top and a red circle down the bottom. And you'll also notice that if you mouse in between the two bottom red circles or in between the two top red circles, you also get a horizontal bar. We'll come back to that in a sec. So the way this vertical correction works is we would grab one of these bottom circles and what we want to do is we want to make this line line up with the verticals on this wall. So, you know, I could use that drain pipe or I could use one of these window or door frames as a guide to just drag that line into vertical alignment with, you know, window frame, door frame, whatever it is. And then over on the other side, we could do the same thing. We could grab the top one, maybe drag that over to there, grab the bottom one, drag it up to there. And then in the middle, you'll see there's a little OK button. Click on OK. And what happens is Darktable has skewed the image in order to compensate for those collapsing verticals. Now, what it does mean is we end up with all of this black, you know, non-pixel data on the sides, which we need to crop out. So I'm going to use a freehand crop. I'm just going to come in here and crop in like so and I'm just going to crop in a fair bit from the top just so I end up with an aspect ratio that feels a bit normal. Double click and we've committed and now we can see our verticals are nice and straight on both sides of the image However, I do feel as though the tower has been compressed. It's like a hobbit tower now. It's been shrunk. It's like somebody stomped on it. So what I could do there is come back to our keystoning menu and select vertical again. And that will put us back into the edit mode. And unfortunately, it's doing something really weird with the crop here. And what I could do is maybe just not correct quite that much. If we maybe just split the difference like so. Click on OK. And there's some really weird stuff going on here. Now, I'm going to have to recrop because we've now got something that feels a little bit more like what I saw with the naked eye. My tower feels like it's got a little bit more height to it. Yes, I've brought back a little bit of the collapsing verticals, but to me, that's an acceptable trade-off. It feels better than it did when I was on the set of Inception, even though it's not quite as correct as maybe it could have been. But to me, that's a, a happy trade-off. Okay, same thing happens with horizontal adjustment. What I should do is actually go and find a different image. Let's do that. Okay, so I found this image, another outtake from my Europe holiday from 2017. It's shot inside a cathedral in Zaragoza in Spain. And let's go horizontal. And again, we'll just grab our little red circle, drag that up so that it lines up with those horizontal lines, or what should be horizontal lines. Do the same down here, click on OK, and boom. And again, we've got some black pixel areas at the top and bottom here that need to be cropped out. So now we can just crop in like so. It does mean I lose that detail from the top of the corner, but so be it. It also means I lose the top of the arch, but I was sort of at the limit of what my wide angle could capture, unfortunately. Double click. And there we go. And we've got reasonably straight horizontal lines that we didn't have before. OK, the last option is full control, which will allow us to do horizontals and verticals at the same time. So we just drag our guides to this is, that's going to get pretty extreme because I need to come right up to here to straighten that vertical. But that means that this is no longer horizontal. So what I would do is bring this up like so and click OK. 
Now that's going to skew it a lot. Yeah, that's what I expected. And unfortunately, I would then have to crop in so much that I would lose a lot of what I really wanted in the image. And you would then have to say, well, was that really worth the expense? You know, I sacrificed so much of the image to get that in. Was it really worth doing? I would argue, no, it wasn't. Okay, let's just come back and look at some of these other tools though. I mentioned the little horizontal bar that you get when you mouse in between the two bottom red circles or between the two top red circles when you are in vertical correction mode. And likewise in horizontal mode you would get it in between the two left hand red circles or the two right hand red circles. What it allows you to do is to left click and drag to shear the image. So if we simply, let's, let's go this way, click on OK and it shears the image like so. Not sure when you would need to use that but once again it's one of those tools that you just go wow they thought of everything with Darktable. The other thing was the little infinity signs on these vertical guides or the horizontal guides depending on which mode you're in. When you click on that you'll notice that both of them turn red and what it means is that now when you adjust one of these red circles inward or outward its partner on the other side will move relative to it so either if you move it out the other one will move out if you move it inwards the other one will move inwards like so so it allows us to speed up our workflow by adjusting both verticals at the same time so if it's simply a case of i just want a little bit of vertical correction here i can just do that click ok and there we go and now i can simply you know crop into however far i want to crop in order to get rid of the black non-pixel areas and boom we're done all right i think that pretty much covers the keystoning effect okay i said i would uh, address a couple of listener or viewer submitted questions or emails uh, i received these couple one was from masood who said here is some incentive for the fifth part straight from the user manual you can inspect the image data corresponding to an individual color channel by holding down the shift key while entering the respective slider with the mouse cursor the center image changes to display the selected color channel either in grayscale values or in false colors depending on the corresponding preference setting in GUI options you may additionally hold down the control key which lets you see the resulting mask overlaid to the image. When leaving the slider, the image goes back to normal after a short delay. You can also hold both control and shift keys down to combine the two views above. Now, I must admit, I've had a play with this and found it to be very hit and miss. I don't know if it's just a quirk with my system, but it seems like sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. If I was to go into something like the Velvia mode here and switch to a parametric mask, we can see we've got our red, green, blue channels here. I'll select the red channel and I'll just take out the darker reds. So if we have a look at our mask overlay there. Now, if I come out of there and I shift click on the triangle ah there you go and now we're back like I said very hit and miss on my system I'm not sure if I'm doing something wrong uh, but apparently you can use those shift modifiers and control modifiers in conjunction with the little triangles here to see the color data for that particular channel.
Next up, I got an email from Chris Shea, who said, Hello, Bruce. My name is Chris Shea. I'm a photographer in Winnipeg, Canada, and I've been reviewing your YouTube videos about Darktable. I find they're very well done, and your explanations and demonstrations about the various aspects of the program are clear and concise. In episode 12, you talk about the base curve presets and how they may not be the best starting point for an image. My personal preference is to have as few presets applied to the raw images as possible. I can always add any of the camera base curves from the presets this way and have sometimes found a different camera's base curve might be more pleasing from which to begin processing an image. If you're not yet aware of the option, I believe you can turn off the base curve so it's not applied to any of the imported raw images. This is done in the core options of the Darktable Preferences menu. It's the last item on the list in the core options section. Thanks for producing the videos. They're an excellent resource for anyone considering Darktable. Sincerely, Chris Shea. Well, Chris, thank you very much for the email, mate. Much appreciated. So as Chris said, go to Preferences, go to Core Options, come right down to the bottom. And as you can see, I've gone in and unchecked mine. Auto Apply Per Camera Base Curve Presets. So if you remember me talking in episode 12 about how the default preset for my alpha had a tendency to blow out highlights. If I'd really pushed my exposure hard to the right on the histogram, then applying the base curve for the Sony Alpha-like preset could wash out some highlights that, after resetting the base curve, were back, and I was able to then edit and keep them. So I've actually disabled that and will uh, do all of my own editing. Thank you very much. <laughs> so thank you for that, Chris. And then Derek uh, commented on video 16 and said, two questions I'd like addressed. What are the two sliders for, the input and output, and how to use the four points on each slider? Well, Derek, if I didn't address that clearly in episode 15, my apologies, I thought I had. I grabbed this out of the dark table manual, and hopefully this will explain it better. Essentially, think of these four red dots as these four triangles on the input and output sliders. Whatever range is covered by the two top triangles, those values, what are called L values in this graph, they will have 100% of the mask. In other words, the mask will be a solid yellow. The areas outside of these two red dots, so the values from 80 to 100 and from 0 to 20, they will have no mask applied. So you'll be seeing a monochrome image. Anything in between will be a gradual linear transition from no mask to full mask. So basically you can use this almost like the mask blur. Think of it like that. The mask blur creates that soft transition on the edge of the mask. That's what you can do with these four triangles, is create that soft transition from no mask up to full mask and then back to no mask at all. As for the input sliders versus the output sliders, the input sliders are the image prior to whatever the current module is designed to do. So if I was to go to my good old favorite, the monochrome, and turn that on, now my image is monochrome. But if I go to the parametric mask, and I say, I want to pick up the hues of you know the marble here, so I'll grab my little eyedropper, click in there. I can see on the input side, that the values for those pixels are somewhere here in the reds, right? So what I can do is bring this up, create a little bit of a transition like so, do the same thing from this side. And if we now look at our mask, we've got something like that. There's a lot of red in this particular image. But what's interesting to note is that where we would normally see another little white mark up here on the output slider, here we're not. And the reason we're not is because the output is showing us the value after 
the current module has been applied, in this case the monochrome module, and so that little white mark is either at the left or the right hand end, I can't really tell from here, is it, no, maybe it's up at the other end, yep, there it is, up there, on the right hand end, so that's why we didn't see a, a little white dotted line here on the output slider was because as far as the output of the monochrome module is concerned, the area under the eyedropper was going to be monochrome and that's why the indicator was right up at the right hand end of the slider. So hopefully that clears that up for you, Derek. If it doesn't, please let me know and I'll see what else I can do to explain the situation for you. All right, people, I think that will do it for the crop tool. Hopefully you learned something useful in this episode and I'll see you in the next one.